we've got another great day lined up today. We're going to start with a panel on uh, data sharing and transparency, uh, followed by a panel on data modeling and analytics. And then uh, after uh, the lunch, uh, at which we have a great keynote speaker, Kara Stein from the SEC, uh, well, we're going to have a panel on data integration and visualization. These, uh, these are all, you know, obviously really important topics as we think about uh, how to improve access, quality, and accessibility, or sorry, uh, uh, quality, scope, and accessibility of the large data sets that we're all uh, interested in. Um, what struck me about yesterday was, you know, we've got a lot of wonderful ideas. Uh, the more we can get specific about how to uh, implement those ideas and to focus on specific cases that interest us and share uh, successes and share obstacles to success uh, across disciplines. I think the, that's where we're going to make some more progress and we've started to do that but um, hopefully uh, in this day and the follow-up uh, to, uh, to this day we'll be able to do some more of that. So that's what I'm going to be looking for in, in uh, uh, in some of these areas uh, as we go through the day. Um, so I think Michael wants to say some things about uh, a new FCC rule that just came out about data privacy. Uh, and we'll do that and then we'll move on to our panel. Thanks. Thanks, Dick, and welcome again to the second day. I'm just going to say a couple things about um, yesterday, which was delightful. And as I said, um, uh, yesterday it made my brain hurt in a good way. Um, the discussions uh, around the conference um, and um, in, the, in the breaks have also been just really exciting. I'll just say a couple things about um, some of the panels yesterday. Um, uh, one is that some of you may have seen the news today, the FCC yesterday, um, or maybe it was released actually this morning, um, issued a new privacy rule um, uh, suggesting that consumers actually do own their data on the Internet, um, which is a big deal. Um, uh, related to this space and to um, the issues we were talking about yesterday. Um, also, a couple of the panelists um, yesterday mentioned that wouldn't it be interesting if people had legal, if firms had legal liability for the refrigerators, for smart refrigerators they sold uh, in relation to the um, service attacks. Uh, but it, it actually turns out that um, there are quite a number of suits that are um, in the process of being formed and filed that I learned about yesterday. So that will be an interesting development to um, uh, to watch, and we'll see uh, whether, in fact, there is um, uh, such liability uh, going um, forward. So I'm um, very excited about uh, today's um, events that um, uh, Dick has outlined. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Matthew Shapiro. Um, thanks. Uh, this has been a great conference, and I hope that we have this panel as just a continued discussion of all the interesting issues that came up yesterday and will unfold today. So I'm, I'm Matthew Shapiro from the Department of Economics at the University of Michigan. And I, I'm, I guess I'm here in a couple of roles. First is a macroeconomist, but probably also more as a data hound. Uh, that's what we do at Michigan. And it's, it's just great that we have three panel members who are engaged, will both tell us about principles. Uh, for getting data out there and the value of getting data out there, but also are engaged in actively in, in, in the good work of uh, disseminating data. So I, I wanted to kick this off by, by first talking about some of the benefits of, uh, of, of having data sharing and, and being, being transparent, because I think that's, it's, data is the quintessential public good uh, that uh, everyone wants it free, but no one, no, uh, and free in many ways, no one wants to pay for it, and that we have that as a huge problem with the internet economy. Uh, but uh, there, there are lots of households and firms who are reluctant to pay the cost in terms of uh, providing, providing data, and some of, some of these costs are real in terms of time, effort, and money, but they're also, uh, uh, concerns about privacy and confidentiality and, and business purpose and agency, uh, which are also out there. So I think having a panel uh, today and uh, more, more generally the overall conference where we talk about uh, different ways in which data can be shared in a way that's beneficial to, uh, to the whole society, but in ways that do recognize the compelling private interests uh, and cost in, in sharing data. But let me, let me mention some of the uh, 
the benefits of, of, uh, of having better data out there. Uh, first, the one which is maybe closest and nearest to my heart is just measurement of key national indicators. I, I was browsing this, the uh, Dodd-Frank uh, statute yesterday, and actually o OFR explicitly is uh, authorized or, or maybe impelled. I'm, I, I'm not, I'll leave, it, I'll leave it to the lawyers and uh, to share data with the Bureau of Economic <coughs> Analysis. And that's the, that's the agency which does GDP accounts. And measuring, uh, measuring the financial sector, which is growing, dynamic, is, a, is an enormous, a, a enormous challenge in terms of both uh, data, conceptual barriers, what, what, is, what are financial services, and, uh, and how, how do we measure those. And that it's a lively area of research. And uh, data such as collected by uh, uh, OFR and by other uh, and by regulatory agencies could be extremely helpful here. So that's that's an important benefit. And getting getting GDP right is one of the key elements of uh, of uh, the information value of it. There's also uh, a, a huge uh, benefits for research on households, firms, and, and in particular how how they interact. So that that and that interaction is something also this panel will. Uh, address because we're talking not just about getting data out there, but getting data one data set connected to to another. So it's there's been enormous research on say how financial shocks are transmitted based on say banking relationships. So is a bank that has a remote uh, uh, financial shock maybe emanating uh, from a uh, housing crisis in one country uh, given cross country lending, it, that could have ripple effects in other countries, and there's a lot of research which has established this. And it's only possible by, uh, to do credibly by tracing out the uh, borrowing and lending relationships among households and firms. So that's just one example of what we can learn. Uh, having, having better data is totally critical to the uh, evaluation of public policies. There was a lot of good discussion of that. Uh, yesterday, but th there, there are countless proposals uh, for, uh, for having interventions or not having interventions, and having these informed by, uh, by sound research, which is, in, which, uh, is increasingly uh, in economics and other social sciences driven by data at the individual level, whether that's a firm or a household, is absolutely critical. Uh, data f uh, is critical for uh, informing public policy decisions. G given the given the current framework, the the, the Federal Reserve uh, would benefit by having more timely data on financial and and economic conditions and making its interest rates decisions. Um, if we had had better data uh, in the fourth quarter of 2008, uh, when, when the economy well, I mean, it, uh, I I don't. The, there was a, about a two percentage point downward revision in GDP in the, sec, in the, in the last quarter of 2008. And basically, uh, uh, may, may, many indicators are highly inertial uh, uh, and extrapolative because, because data come, become available uh, slowly over time. And uh, the uh, key indicators do particularly bad in the uh, for turning points because that's when when inertia really hurts, and I think it's probably an uncontroversial statement to say that had 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 GDP uh, been plummeting uh, the way it is now measured, uh, and had that been had that been widely understood in in two thousand in two thousand eight as the Obama administration was coming in and, and formulating the stimulus package, uh, it would have been easier to argue. For a larger and more maybe a longer duration stimulus package, and and that's it. That's a key, uh, a key example of where having better and more timely data is valuable. And some of the opportunities in terms of big data, automatic feeds, uh, monitoring disparate sources of data, including things like being done at the Bank of England using social media as a short run economic indicator, uh, could be extremely helpful. Uh, and then at, at, at the core of, uh, of OFR's uh, mandate and the purposes of this, uh, of this uh, conference is uh, the role of having better data for understanding 
financial uh, financial stability. Uh, that uh, that I, that I think was was one of the key driving uh, principles between b behind including OFR in the uh, Dodd Frank and. Uh, and you know, there's some trade-offs. Firms need to, financial firms in particular, need to uh, share data that's uh, potentially quite sensitive and timely because what matters for financial stability, as we've learned, uh, or I hope we've learned, is the interconnection of firms and uh, potential, potential cascades from uh, uh, from one one firm having having problems making payments or being insolvent, and uh, part of the architecture of what OFR uh, is mandated to do and is indeed working on is to trace out these interconnections, and uh, that's extremely valuable. Uh, and uh, it also I think we have to acknowledge extremely sensitive because we're we're asking about uh, short run core business activities of. Uh, of very uh, very large corporations who have uh, a substantial amount of uh, th th this is bread and butter at least for major parts of their operations uh, so is is sensitive uh, so I think it's important to have continued discussion of this and to explain and continue to emphasize that there's some value to this uh, uh, we really don't want to have the kind of uh, unraveling that we've seen repeatedly uh, and and Work being done by people in this room can potentially uh, can, can potentially address that. So there are a number of uh, uh, I, I hope I, I suspect there'll be some lively discussion. But I, I hope what's coming out of this panel and the uh, uh, the conference in general is that there there are there are a lot of opportunities for making for making progress, uh, uh, particularly with the leadership of of folks in this room. Uh, and it's, it's uh, time to figure out uh, multiple ways of, of uh, sharing data. And the, the benefits, I think, clearly out, out, outweigh the risks, uh, but the risks must be managed. So there are various, there are various modes for uh, sharing data, for getting academics and other interested researchers uh, getting access. There's a huge reservoir of uh, uh, economists and social science and legal scholars who are eager to do uh, research with this. This is in, in, in a time of tight budgets. Agencies should be looking uh, to harness uh, the free, uh, uh, essentially voluntary work of the of the of the academic community, f focused very focused very much on the uh, their the, their various mandates. This works extremely well in the. Well, in the statistical system, where there's a system of uh, research data networks, uh, research data and research data centers, which allow under uh, quite strict uh, rules uh, access to academics uh, uh, to non-public data in, in secure environment. That's a potential model. Uh, there are other models having bringing, bringing academics in as special sworn uh, or temporary workers that can, that can be considered. Uh, but I think we need to expose uh, sort of what are the sources of resistance to this and, and help to provide uh, solutions. And I'm very glad we have a panel of, of, of individuals who are thinking and actually not just thinking but doing along, along these lines. So I will, I will stop there. I'll have more uh, later. I want to introduce our, our speakers uh, 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 in order that I'll ask them to speak. Uh, so Deborah Lucas is the Sloan Distinguished Professor of Finance and Director of the MIT Golub Center for Finance and, and Policy. Uh, again, she is a, she's a doer. She has substantial government experience, including Associate Director of CBO, uh, with an attention on, on issues of uh, credit in particular that she will be speaking about and, and has specific proposals for making progress. Um, uh, David Ballat is a senior analyst for advanced analytic divisions of the Bank of England. The, the, the Bank of England, uh, as part of its strategic plan, uh, is 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 thinking and doing uh, uh, many many things that involve uh, big data, social media data, uh, uh, data on households transactions, data uh, on vacancies, 
there's just a huge amount of work being done there, and some of it is in, in cooperation with other, uh, with, other, uh, with other entities, including the OFR. And finally, Matthew Reed is chief counsel of the Office of Financial Research, and he has a, I'm sure, an enormous portfolio, but part, part of it is trying to figure out how, 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 how these problems can be attacked and how, how data can be brought into the agency, used by the agency, and I hope also used by uh, other scholars and interested parties. So uh, let's kick it off with uh, Debbie. Thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure and honor to be included in this. I'm learning uh, an enormous amount. So what, what I'm um, going to talk about is at first blush going to look very specific, which is the case for sharing loan level data from US federal credit programs. Um, <clears throat> but just to put this in context, the big picture is that we don't have a private sector financial market. We have a mixed economy financial market. The government has an enormous footprint in financial markets, and a lot of the data about finance and the functioning of those markets resides in government agencies. Um, so the case I'm going to make is, in fact, we have, at the moment, much less disclosure from the federal government of financial data than we do from the private sector. And this is really an ask to bring the federal government disclosures up to something comparable or even beyond the level of what we get from the private sector. And the reason for that is that these are extremely essential parts of the financial market. So that's the big picture. Um, so I'm going to um, try to um, change maybe the way you look at the federal government and convince you that you should think of it as actually the world's largest financial institution. Um, and this is because of the size and scope of its um, credit activities broadly understood or aggregated together. Um, Importantly, um, it's the largest conduit of credit to the to U.S. households. So if you take the mortgage markets and the student loan markets, that's the biggest credit markets out there. Um, you have credit cards on top of that, but that's that's way way smaller. Okay, so um, I want to talk about what sorts of data. Um, the government has what sorts of data it collects, um, what it shares and what it doesn't, and potentially what could be shared, what the benefits of that are. And um, I'll talk a bit about the impediments, though. I think I'm going to leave the impediments to my fellow panelists because, um, as, as, as Matt said, I think this is so important that the impediments pale um, relative to the value of, getting, of finding ways to get this information out there, but respecting um, the issues that are there. Okay, so um, this is going to be like unpacking a Russian doll. I'm going to start from the top. Um, so um, on this issue of the U.S. government <clears throat> being, in fact, the world's largest financial institution, um, if I look at the federal government in that big bar, um, I would say there's about $18 trillion, 18 to $20 trillion of assets or insured obligations. So this is the sum of things I would put into the broad bucket of credit-related activities. It doesn't count Social Security or anything like that. So compare that, say, 18 trillion to what we think of as the giant financial institutions that the OFR is concerned, rightly, about um, following JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Goldman. Those are all institutions in the one to three trillion dollar kind of size range. So you can see that kind of an aggregate, the US government is definitely up there. Um, so where did that 18 trillion kind of calculation come from? Well, the data is a little old, 2014, because it's hard. <laughs> the, gov the government doesn't release data that in that timely manner. But in any case, the biggest single category is deposit insurance. Then there's Fannie and Freddie. There's pension guarantees, which cover defined benefit pension plans, which is like a kind of debt. Then there's what I would call the traditional credit programs, which includes many mortgage programs, um, student loans, and the like. I'll talk more about that in a second. There's the federal home loan banks, and there's a the farm credit system. So those are, the those are the components of that $18 trillion of federal credit activities. What I want to focus on today is what I would call the traditional 
government credit programs. And um, let's dig down a bit into those. So that's, those are on order of $4 trillion of obligations outstanding. And um, those programs have grown rapidly, especially rapidly through the financial crisis compared to the private markets, um, but they've grown over time and they continue to grow. Um, so what do we have here? Well, that lower blue bar is the sum of direct federal loans and, and guaranteed loans which go to housing, so basically mortgages. And these are mortgage programs that do not include Fannie and Freddie. So the biggest of these is the Federal Housing Administration that guarantees loans to first-time home buyers. Another big component of that housing bar is the Veterans Administration, and then the third big component is the Rural Housing Service that provides mortgages in rural areas. Okay. The next biggest chunk and the piece of federal credit programs that have grown the most rapidly are the student loan programs. So that's the orange that you see there. And um, that's grown to over a trillion dollars outstanding of federal student loans. Um, the federal government also has a reasonably large footprint in small, in small business lending and farming, which is the green there. Um, they support international lending, say, through the Exim Bank. And then um, they, they provide credit to all kinds of smaller things, to energy, to health. So there's a lot of credit programs scattered throughout the government. And in fact, even though it's relatively small, sometimes these small programs get a lot of attention. So it was, for instance, embedded in the energy category, Solyndra, which is something many of you have heard of, is sitting there. OK. Um, so. The, again, this is $4 trillion in aggregate now of credit. And um, these programs are spread across many different agencies in the federal government. So every single agency has at least one or two programs. Some of them have many, many credit programs. In total, there's more than 100 separate credit programs um, that run fairly independently often from each other. So um, these programs collect data on the loans that they guarantee or make directly. And exactly what they collect varies a huge amount across the programs. And the quality, uh, the quality also varies a lot. But, but in terms of what they choose to collect, um, some of it is going to depend on the program goals, um, the rules of the program, and so forth. Okay, but things that are pretty um, universally there in the government somewhere is that they're keeping track of the loan characteristics at origination. You're going to know the maturity of the loan, the size of the loan, whether it's a fixed or floating rate, what the interest rate is, what the various fees involved are. Um, in the case of guaranteed loans, and by the way, I should probably define a bunch of these things, but a guaranteed loan is one where the government doesn't directly provide the funds, but they take all or some of the credit risk. So if there is a private lender involved or a guaranteed lender, you would know the lender ID, and then there's all kinds of potentially options for prepayment and so forth. Okay. Um, something else that the government keeps track of at origination is something about borrower demographics. So if you are a student taking out a loan, we would know what school you went to. Um, we would know your age. We would know various things about you. And then, um, there's also data that has to be maintained about the performance of each individual loan over time. So you're going to see how much has been, how much is paid back each period, um, what's delinquent, what the recoveries are, and so forth. Okay. Um, so, with the, so as I said, this data resides in different federal agencies, and then it's pushed up to OMB because I would say that in some ways the principal reason that the data is collected is for budgetary purposes. So where the data winds up being summarized and what the public can see is basically what comes out in the federal budget or specifically in annexes to the federal budget. 
For the budget geeks among you, you probably know about this volume of the budget called Analytical Perspectives. And it's really this beautiful, thoughtful discussion by the federal government about the kind of the difficult things in the government. And <clears throat> definitely credit programs are some of the difficult things of the government. So there's always a chapter on credit and insurance. And it, this, this just strikes me as hilarious. I don't know if it strikes you as hilarious. But it's chapter 20 of analytical perspectives. And it's less than 30 pages long. And it covers that over $4 trillion of federal credit programs. Um, there's one or two tables at the end there with very high level summary statistics on all those credit programs. Um, another place where you can get information about federal credit um, is the federal credit supplement. And this is about a hundred odd page um, piece of the budget, which has very useful tables if you're a credit geek. And, um, but again, it's, it's, um, it's not information that tells you a lot about performance. So <clears throat> what you're basically getting, <clears throat> well, what you're basically getting is a snapshot of each year um, you're getting aggregate loans by program, you're getting something on new originations, and you get some information on expected portfolio performance for each individual program. Remember, there's over 100 programs, uh, but you're not getting anything specific about the performance of individual cohorts. And I'm going to turn back to that in a second. Um, but just to give you an example, <clears throat> excuse me, in fact, of what this information is masking. Within the federal government, there's no standardization of something like the definition of a default. So when you look in the credit supplement, you can see default rates for different programs, um, but it's not calculated in a completely standardized way. And you can get things like the, you know, you can get things like default rates of 120 percent. So it's also not calculated in a way that's consistent with how the private sector would define default. So there's, there's, uh, there isn't any central reporting standards. But that's complaining about what they do, not what they reveal. So let me go back to what they reveal. Okay. So what you would also like to understand is. Um, how are different cohorts of loans performing over time? And <clears throat> the question is, what data now is out there about that? Well, again, all of this comes back to a very budgetary perspective. And so what is revealed is something called subsidy reestimates. Unfortunately, credit is accounted for in a rather complicated way. But the basic idea is that the budget records credit subsidies and those subsidies are meant to represent a lifetime cost of a new cohort of loans over the life of the loans. So I like to use the student loan example. So this year, all the new student loans have a budgetary cost that reflects a projection of all the cash flows in and out over their lifetime discounted back to the present. So the net cost is like the value of the net losses that the government is absorbing. Okay, so, that's, so at the time you have a new cohort of loans, you have the subsidy estimate. But over time, things happen. So default rates might be higher or lower than you expect, or prepayment rates might be higher or lower. And so there's something called re-estimates. And those re-estimates track what actually has happened and expectations about what will change in the future. So these re-estimates are a way of talking about how well your original estimates um, work compared to what actually happens in the world. But the problem with this reestimation data is it doesn't really give you very specific information about when defaults happen and what's driven by other technical assumptions and what's a projection and what's actually happened. So it really is, again, it's a very aggregate kind of way of looking at performance data and it's, it's, it's very hard to interpret. So what does the government have that they could or should share? Well, in order to really understand what's going on in these programs, to understand the unfolding pressures, what we would like to have is a time series of the individual loan level raw data on performance. And this really would be big data, because there's millions and millions of records. Um, uh, what I should say, because housing came up 
yesterday, and it will come up again, is that in the area of mortgage guarantees, um, the government discloses more information than they do for any of these other programs. So um, really the big, <laughs> the big deal in the room is student loans, the 1.2 trillion of student loans. But um, the dis I'm not complaining so much about the housing disclosure. But in any case, you do have some loan level data on housing, but you don't have it on any of these other programs that I listed. Okay. Um, at a minimum, well, before I leave the individual loan level raw performance data, even more ideal than having that time series data for each cohort, um, you would like to potentially link it with other administrative data in order to have a more complete picture of what's happening to, say, students over time from different cohorts when they graduate. Um, at a very minimum, if you couldn't provide that individual data, you would want to provide aggregate cohort level raw performance data over time. And this is in contrast to mostly what's reported now, which is a portfolio approach. So when I say a portfolio approach, I mean that you're looking at statistics on things like defaults on student loans that mix default rates on loans that were made 15 years ago with default rates that were made last year. And so you can't really understand um, the evolution of the experience of the borrowers or of the government um, when you aggregate things on a portfolio level. So you have to really understand what happens to each cohort. Okay. Um, so this information actually is available because, as I said before, it's an input into the budgetary process. So um, the government does need to, to collect it. Okay. Um, so why do, why is all of this so important. Um, obviously, there's transparency issues. Um, when you have $4 trillion of credit exposure, the taxpayers are absorbing that risk. Those risks could be larger or smaller. Um, it seems like the public should have the information available to understand what those exposures and risks are. Um, uh, another issue on the transparency front and the need to bring more attention to the statistics about these programs is that when you do think about them, they really change your view of what a sufficient statistic is for the fiscal position of the U.S. government. Um, so some of you might have seen a few weeks ago there was an article that said um, what's going on, deficits aren't growing nearly as fast as the debt, and what's going on with that? And the answer is, well, it's the student loan program because the government is making ma hundreds of billions of dollars of student loans, and they're doing it through what's called direct lending. So they're borrowing money from tre through Treasury in order to turn around and make student loans. So that kicks up the debt, but it creates an asset, which is the student loan, along with the liability, which is the treasury debt. So, but for the credit risk, it's kind of a wash for the government. So it looks like the debt is growing this large amount. It looks like the government has spent a lot of money, but they haven't really spent it. They've assumed some credit risk, but it's much smaller. So the whole way that you understand debt and deficits and the fiscal situation changes quite a bit. Um, a few months ago, I wrote a paper for Brookings which estimated the stimulus effect of these credit programs and came to the conclusion that they were as important as the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in terms of fiscal stimulus during the crisis. Or another way to say that is that even monetary policy um, largely goes through debt markets and if the government's footprint in debt markets is so large, you're going to see that monetary policy intermediated by these credit programs. So um, just to understand um, the world, you need to, you need to be more transparent about what's going on in these programs. So um, obviously also this data is essential for program evaluation. Um, I alluded to the importance of cohort data. You'd like to know um, who's being served and who isn't. We have some demographics. We know um, there is, I, and I shouldn't say that nothing comes out because, it's, for instance, the Department of Education itself writes reports about things like nonprofit schools and how the graduation rates are terrible and the student loans aren't a good deal for them. But that data, that raw data to come to those conclusions is not made available to the research community and so we can't really check to understand whether 
to what extent that's true or what's the subtlety about it and all the rest of it. Um, I also think that um, making this data available would do wonders for the quality of data within the government. So my experience working with credit programs at CBO was I was shocked and appalled. Um, be, I mean, and saddened. I mean, I, I actually have, I am someone who believes that civil servants do the best they can, um, but the best they could was very, very, very sad. So on some of these smaller credit programs, this data is being collected on an Excel spreadsheet, and I'm not sure it survives from year to year. So there's, there's these kind of, you know, if Citibank had some of their divisions doing their loan reporting on an Excel spreadsheet, you'd be pretty alarmed. And so we're talking about a financial institution as big as any of these other ones. And so I think that just shining a light on this data would also help those institutions find ways to improve their record keeping and all that. Um, I also want to point out that there's been recently, in, um, very recently, um, in the last few years, there's been legislation which has really promoted the idea of evidence-based policy making. And I think um, that's certain for the federal government. And so you could almost read these laws as requiring the government to better use this data in order to evaluate these programs. Um, this next point is a little more, I think, two-edged. Um, this data would be of enormous value to the private sector as well. Um, so one of the things about federal credit programs is a lot of people believe that what they should be doing is providing credit to people who couldn't get it from the private marketplace. It should be filling gaps, credit which is somehow never going to be worthwhile for the, the private sector to participate in. Um, but you would like to make it possible for a private entrants to serve those people who they can. And I think the data from these programs would be invaluable for banks thinking about, well, who could we serve? If we had better performance data, it would possibly allow the private sector to enter more. Um, some of you are probably thinking, well, it would allow the private sector to cherry pick from the government, and so actually that would be worse and not better. Um, but my response to that is, I'm not sure you should think of it as cherry picking, because what's happening now is kind of budgetary cross-subsidization, but nevertheless, you want your subsidy dollars to go to those riskiest borrowers, presumably the ones that the private sector won't serve, and so you're hiding the fact um, that you're trying to help this very disadvantaged population by the fact that you're making massive loans to the middle or upper middle class, um, but making it possible for the private sector to come in and fairly price to that middle class segment isn't exactly that kind of negative cherry picking. In any case, that's, that's my point. Other people can definitely dispute that. Um, and then finally, and importantly for this audience, um, I think arguably um, the federal footprint in the credit markets has um, a big effect on systemic risk. Obviously the housing market was ground zero of the financial crisis. Um, it's still true that most mortgage credit risk is absorbed um, by the government. And um, without the kind of data that I'm talking about, um, I don't think it's possible for an organization like OFR, FSOC, to fully understand the stresses that are building up in the financial system. So again, to go back to student loans, there's generally been concern in the media that what have these large debt burdens done? How are they affecting young people's ability to form households, to buy houses, and so forth? Um, is that a building systemic risk? So I mean, it's interesting because I think that the systemic risks that come from these government credit programs are very, are very low frequency risks. And a lot of times we're worried about high frequency risks, like high frequency trading. Um, but still, I think there are systemic risks that arise from this program. For instance, if you have your primary mortgage institutions making a particular rule, and that rule turns out to create a systemic risk, someone should be watching out from that. Because these agencies themselves have a particular mission, which is to serve whoever they're serving, it's no individual agency's mission to watch out for any collateral systemic risk they're creating. So just like the banks 
don't have to directly worry about systemic risk. That's why we have the government and the OFR. In the same way, these government agencies don't have anyone at the agency looking out for the potential systemic risks that they're, that they're looking for. So again, data would speak a lot to that. Okay, um, I don't think this is easy. Um, <laughs> there's all the issues that come up and will continue to come up today are there um, in the case of these government programs. There's privacy concerns. Um, you cannot discount um, the amount of angst proposals like this create within government agencies. Um, we think of private financial institutions screaming about regulatory burden. Um, in some ways, you get the same kind of reactions from program administrators who feel like they have very limited resources already and that those limited resources shouldn't be squandered on accounting, on data, and so forth. So you get the same kind of internal resistance that you do um, in the private sector. And I think there's legitimacy to that because certainly um, the government is in many ways running on a shoestring and it's hard to make something like data collection a high priority. Um, beyond that, there's concern, as there is in any organization, that when you open things up to scrutiny, you'll get in trouble, um, the programs will be defunded, there'll be um, negative consequences to providing that data, and so there's, there's always the tendency to want to protect what you're doing. Um, so recognizing those challenges, I think, again, that many of these are the same or similar to those in the private sector, but there are some mitigating factors for these government programs. Um, and one does have to do with proprietary interests because uh, the government um, isn't doing the kind of trading where they're gonna get front run or anything like that. So you know, I think making that data public, it is, it's public data, it's a public good. There's, there's not a lot of argument for proprietary interest. Again, there are these recent legislative mandates that are telling the government that they should um, use data. And so there is, there's almost a law which says, well, they should figure out a way of overcoming um, these challenges. So I'll just, um, and there by saying <clears throat> what seems probably obvious, that I think that sharing this data is essential for transparency, for program evaluation, for control of systemic risk. Um, oh, I wanted to mention there are efforts underway to obtain it. So there's, um, there's, there's various little forays. Sorry? Yeah, I'll hold those to general discussion and I'll just say, let's just do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, David Bollett of the uh, Bank of England. And it, it, if you have an animation, I'm going to go. Hey, cheers, Triplets in Washington from here. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, let me just begin with the standard disclaimer, though it's a serious one, that uh, my comments are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Bank of England. Uh, let me also start by acknowledging uh, the hosts. Thank you, Professor Barr and the University of Michigan for having me here. Thanks, of course, to Dick Berner and the team and my friends at the U.S. Office of Financial Research. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. And a special thanks, I think, is owed to, uh, to Karen Edmond, Jenny Ricard, Christy Baer, who've just done an excellent job uh, from a logistical standpoint organizing this conference. I know I owe a special debt uh, to all of you, so thank you very much. Um, this panel, of course, is titled Data Sharing. And just so you know that I practice what I'm about to preach, uh, Karen, Jenny, and Christy have sent out this hour to your inboxes a brand new data set that's now posted on the Bank of England's website. So many of you have your laptops, smartphones. You can check your inboxes right now. You will have received an email uh, with this data set. Uh, and 
Christmas has come early, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> because I have given you what you've always wanted, which is the Bank of England's balance sheet between 1844 and 2006 on a weekly basis. <laughs> you know, da data is no a non-rivalrous good, so you can actually forward this on to your friends and family for Christmas. Uh, and, you know, give it as an, as an early Christmas gift. Now, what's really novel here, let me tell you, it's novel. Of course, we've published the bank's balance sheet before, but it's always been on an annual basis. Uh, and this is weekly. So it's this uh, frequency of the data, which is, is quite no novel. And just to give you an idea of the kind of analysis that you might want to undertake with this type of data, we're actually doing some of our own. So what you can do is actually take a look back at the bank's historic balance sheet, go down to weeks and see moments when there might have been financial crises. In fact, financial crises that hitherto we didn't know about. When you're looking for an expansion in the uh, amounts of, amount of notes in circulation and a dim, diminution uh, of the gold stock, you know, these are moments of potential financial stress. And what we're doing now is actually linking this weekly balance sheet data. So this is research that I'm actively involved in at the moment. We hope to publish it early next year. And link that with even more granular transactional ledger data. So what you're seeing here, for example, is a transactional ledger from 1853. And it gives you the information on every single loan that the bank is making, the names of the counterparties, the rate at which that loan is being made, uh, what, what's the value of the collateral that's being brought in, whether collateral's being uh, re rejected, uh, et cetera. And we're starting to do some preliminary analysis. So here is some data from the 1847 crisis, I know near and dear to many of your hearts. Uh, and what you can see is, uh, and this is quite typical actually with, with this data, it's highly skewed. So the bank is making a large number of loans to just a handful of counterparties. Uh, and so then we can start to actually answer old questions with new data. You know, when and to what extent did the Bank of England start acting as a lender of last resort? When was it uh, going about using Badgett's principles of lending freely on good collateral at a penalty rate? And we can then tell, we know subsequently what happened to these firms. Was the bank lending to firms that were uh, merely illiquid but not insolvent, or did they end up, the, the counterparties end up being duds? And just so you don't think that this is sort of uh, antiquarianism, I will remind you that uh, Thomas Piketty, a couple of years ago, did some trawling of data, 18th, 19th century tax records, and it's really had an impact in our thinking about inequality in the 21st. And I don't think that our research will have that kind of impact. Uh, but nevertheless, I do think it will help us better understand uh, the Bank of England's behavior in the past and hopefully uh, improve uh, policy going forward in the future. So having fulfilled my most important duty of the day, which was to share data with all of you, um, I just want to make uh, sort of three key points because the way I think about data sharing is really at three different levels. So we have data sharing within our organizations. There's data sharing between our organizations and the kinds of organizations I'm talking about are central banks and financial regulatory bodies. And of course, then there's data sharing outside our organization, primarily with the public who we serve. So within our organization, data sharing between our organizations and data sharing outside of our organization. So let me start with data sharing within an organization. So I recently did a webinar for centralbanking.com on the topic of big data. And one of the questions that came up was, um, who within a central bank should own the data? Should it be the statistics function, the chief data officer division, technology? And in, my, in our case, so I, I work in an area of the bank called advanced analytics, which is a data science function. Now, who should own this data? And I really challenged the assumptions underpinning that question. Because I think thinking about and ident trying to identify within a central bank or another equivalent financial regulatory body, the owner of the data 
is fraught with difficulty because it makes sort of pregnant within that language the possibility that people are going to start to see that data as theirs and therefore they're not going to share it. Um, and where we're sort of moving within the bank is away from this language of ownership to the language of an ecosystem. And so let me tell you concretely what that means. Many of you will be familiar with BCBS 239, which was this consultation put out by the Basel Commission about effective risk data aggregation. And that was prompted, of course, by the fact that in the financial crisis, uh, we soon came to realize that many financial institutions didn't have a full understanding of the kinds of risks that they were running. The data was strewn about in different business lines, different subsidiaries, different countries, and it was never really effectively brought together. And that certainly applied to private sector financial institutions. I'd go so far to ask the question to all of us, does that also apply to our own institutions? Do we as central banks, and this is very much in the same spirit that uh, Debbie's uh, comments were made, do we fully understand the risks that public sector institutions are running? Are we managing our data according to the BCBS 239 principles as well? If we are going to be proverbial physicians dispensing medicine to the patient, then we should be able to take some ourselves. And we've started to take that to heart at the bank. And one initiative in the last couple of years led by our chief data officer division is to create, and has been to create, something called a data inventory. And what this is, is a log of all of the data sets within the bank. Now you might think that that's, you know, some easy feat, but uh, in fact, it was really, it's really been a step change. Because if you're going to share data, in a sense that presupposes that you already know what the stock of data you have in your building uh, is, is there to share. Um, and with this data inventory, now we do. And so what that allows anybody within the organization to do is to go onto this data inventory and see a log of all of these data sets, search for them by tags that are assigned by users of these data. So you can search by operational risk or credit risk or by the names of an individual institution and you'll get back some filtered results. Now where do we need to go next? I think we need to move uh, from a log to actually a a portal, a downloadable portal, sort of a one-stop shop where people could actually get all of those data sets internally, you know, uh, with the idea that most data sets should be open by default and uh, to, to people working within the central bank. Um, and the reason that this is important is really just efficiency. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, data is a non-rivalrous good, so why do we want to impose artificial barriers to entry for people who might want to do uh, analysis. So that's sort of data sharing uh, within an organization. Uh, now about data sharing between organizations. So I have a friend of mine named Rosa Lastra who's a professor of law actually, quite appropriate since we're here in a law school uh, in, in the UK. And she has a very nice phrase that uh, sort of identifies one of the key challenges that we all face, which is that the financial system is global in scope, but our financial regulatory apparatuses still tend to be national at scale. And so one way to overcome this incongruence is with data sharing. And I think there have been a lot of uh, recent positive steps in that direction. So the Financial Stability Board getting set up and uh, under the auspices of uh, a data gap stream starting to collect uh, data in a standardized way through uh, standardized templates, for example, on large exposures. Of course, the work of the Bank for International Settlements should be mentioned here in terms of aggregating consolidated statistics and then sharing them with the public from central banks all around the world, and in particular, uh, Aurel Schubert, who's here. Um, has been leading the IFC work, the Irving Fisher Committee's work around uh, effective data sharing. And actually, uh, Dick Berner yesterday made mention of a ec very excellent paper that he recommended and I also recommend to all of you, which is about data sharing, which was uh, the result of this task force that uh, Aurel uh, headed up. And I should also mention a, a highlight uh, for us last year at the bank, which is that we concluded with the OFR 
an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, to actually share data between our two institutions. Uh, and of course, Matt Reed was sort of the, you know, the, the champion and at the forefront of doing this. Um, and again, that's important because, at least in some state of the world, sharing data across borders could be as critical in a future financial crisis as the provision of central bank swap lines cross borders were in the last one. Um, there are no doubt challenges here, uh, obviously politics, but even leaving politics aside, there are IT issues about the uh, interoperability of different systems to exchange data. But those challenges, while they're daunting, I don't think should uh, in any way detract us from the prizes to be won and they are great, which is that we can start to take different pieces of the puzzle and put them together and come to a truly system, systemic view of systemic risk. Um, and we're still a ways away from that. So for example, one of the highly touted uh, parts of Dodd-Frank and of EMIR, which is sort of the equivalent regulation uh, in Europe, has been to create trade repositories that now allow regulators uh, access to seeing all of the derivative transactions that are going on, whether it's forwards, options, swaptions, you name it. The problem still is that as a regular uh, uh, default, most regulators are only seeing their part of the picture. So uh, in a UK regulatory context, that means that uh, the bank is typically seeing those derivative transactions that are either sterling denominated or where the underlying is a UK referent or one of the legs of the transaction are a UK counterparty. But wouldn't it be better if all of those G20 countries were seeing all of the data on a regular basis? So I think that uh, uh, we still have a ways to go in terms of sharing data between regulators, but there have been, has been progress since the financial crisis. And then finally, let me talk about uh, data sharing with uh, the public. So last year, the bank published uh, its research agenda. And as part of that, I was responsible for publishing six previously proprietary data sets. Uh, and they can be found on the bank's website down here. And they contained uh, several different series here, uh, but anonymized individual and company level responses to uh, surveys that we conduct also sort of long-run macro time series, not dissimilar to the long-run balance sheet series I showed you earlier. And then on the basis of that, uh, we put out a call for uh, submissions by members of the public to actually work with these data. And we had a data visualization competition. I'm showing you here the winning result, which was produced by Kath Sleeman who is a researcher at Nesta, which is a, a research foundation in the UK that looks at, at, at innovation. And she created this really neat interactive data visualization. And what it shows is basically uh, the G7 countries and all of sort of the pre-recessionary, recessionary, and then post-recessionary periods uh, since 1970. Um, and what's cool here is you can click on any of these sort of buttons. So if you click on depth here, it basically sorts the depths of the recession. So you see that the most recent out of all of the G7 recessions since 1970, the one that the UK experienced over the period 2008 to 2013 uh, was the most severe, or one of the most severe in all, out of all of these G7 countries. Uh, but uh, certainly the most severe out of all of the recessions that the UK faced in that time period. And so what you're seeing there is basically the depth of the recession as measured by uh, sort of pre-recessionary GDP peak to recessionary GDP trough. So it was a decline there of, uh, of 6%. Um, and here is a real r concrete example of where you can start to see the benefit of sharing data with the public you can start to crowdsource these data sets and actually gain new insights. But I think even a more fundamental reason that, of course, we as central banks need to share data is, of course, uh, and this has already been mentioned, the issue of public accountability. Um, 
because the corollary of central bank independence is that uh, we need to be open and transparent. And the central bank, uh, in the case of the Bank of England, 100% equity is owned by Treasury. Treasury is ultimately funded by the taxpayers. And so in a sense, the data that we have should be seen as a kind of public good. Um, I want to give you one more example here of some work that we've done. I don't know if my chart's coming up here. It may not show in Mozilla. Uh, no, I'm okay, thanks. Uh, while, while that's loading, let me just sort of caveat what I said about data sharing with the public in, in sort of two ways. And that is, um, Data sharing here means that it's with the consent of the institution that we're talking about, okay? Um, and that means that there should be a legitimate public interest in that data. And we get Freedom of Information Requests Act, uh, Freedom of in Information Requests for, you know, what books are bank staff checking out from the library? <laughs> this made front page of City AM, which is a London uh, city newspaper last year. Um, I don't know that that information directly bears on the ability of the central bank to execute its um, mandate of promoting monetary and financial stability. So, um, so we should share, uh, but it should be consensual, and the data that we're sharing should be of legitimate public interest. Um, and the other thing to say is that, you know, uh, data sharing here exists along a spectrum. It's not just a binary choice for any of us to have closed data and 100% open data. There are ways when you're sharing data that you need uh, often, if you're dealing with sensitive data, to um, anonymize it in different ways. So we talked about masking a bit yesterday, so removing individuals' names. Uh, you can talk about perturbation, where you add a little bit of symmetrical noise to each one of the, the data points, uh, or you round the values or some sort of generalization techniques where essentially you take specific discrete uh, values and then you actually bucket them. So rather than reporting that there's a loan made to a 27-year-old uh, in London, it might be a loan made to somebody between the ages of 25 and 34 in um, southern England, something like this. And I'll give you a good example um, of where we've done some work in this regard. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, I worked with some colleagues at the Open Data Institute, which is, uh, I guess what you would call 501c3 here in the, uh, in the US, but a, basically a research nonprofit. And as their name betrays, they're all about open data and finding ways to make the, uh, the, the world a more open and transparent place. And we worked with them. This was at a time when peer-to-peer -peer lending in the UK was becoming quite hot, as I know it's become quite hot here in the US as well, but we didn't have a lot of data on it. And so we went to the three largest peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending uh, firms at the time, which were Ratesetter, Zopa, and Funding Circle, which comprised about 95% of the peer-to-peer -peer lending market. And we asked if they would let us uh, analyze their data, not only analyze their data, but to actually publish it. And that's exactly what we did. And so we took that individual uh, loan level data, so we're talking about 14 million loans, uh, so semi-big data, and we anonymized it. We then published it here. You can get the data. You can see it's all available. And then on the basis of this data, we actually were able to build uh, this cartogram that you see over here, so this map that actually shows uh, different regions within the UK, and you can actually drill down to in individual level postcodes to see which parts of the UK are net creditors or debtors within this peer-to-peer -peer lending market, at least at that time when we did the analysis. Um, so it is possible uh, to do this kind of uh, granular data release. And so I would just close by saying that 
the focus of my comments this morning have been all about the central bank sharing more data, but sort of uh, Pache or Contra uh, Debbie's comments, actually, I'd like to place the, the onus on some of our regulatory, uh, our regulated financial institutions to do something like this, to take uh, as their example what the fintech firms here were able to do in terms of publishing uh, granular data, anonymized data, working with us, uh, because you can only get so much information from annual reports and accounts. You really do need to understand the, the data at a granular a level to get any real insight. And I think I will end there. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, final speaker is Matt, Matt Reed of OFR. Good morning. Uh, so I am the chief counsel of the OFR, and after the call to action that Debbie made and the beautiful uh, examples of sharing and public disclosure of data that David made, I get to be the skunk at the picnic and talk about um, the difficulties that, that we face. But I'll do it, uh, I think, in a way that um, can uh, uh, provide some ideas for solving some of these problems. First, I'll start at the higher level uh, and then get deeply into the weeds. W one thing that I, I think is useful to bear in mind as we see all this data that we know exists and we can't get access to is the policy objective for having collected it in the first instance. So there is clearly a need um, uh, that has been identified by whoever the regulator or authority was to compel the institution that created the data or the individual that created the data um, to provide it to whomever, whether it's the public through a disclosure law, whether it's the government through a reporting requirement. But um, that policy gets reflected in the first instance in a law and then in a regulation. Um, and it's a very important point that I think Debbie uh, touched on a, a minute ago, uh, which is the institution that is doing the collection can only do so um, uh, to the breadth of its regulatory authority. And that becomes a very, very big issue for us as we, in the, um, in the middle of all these agencies, look to, to try to share and gather uh, data. So, um, what is the policy objective? If it's a dis uh, um, uh, uh, an investor protection objective, um, you, may, uh, you may seek a, a broad uh, disclosure of the data. That's the 10 Ks and Qs. I think government has done a decent job. The SEC has done a good job with its interactive data work, its XBRL, to try to make that more accessible. Um, the process that is engaged to, uh, to collect this data is, is the, the Legal Administrative Procedure Act uh, rulemaking process. And what that does is it alerts the, the would-be providers of the data the intended um, purpose of the collection. And again, that intended purpose is tethered to the jurisdiction of the agency that's doing the collection. They take comments and then they try to wrestle with what is the, what is the level of granularity and ex, uh, exposure that, that is appropriate. And I just give a quick example of how government thinks through this problem through uh, experience. Several years ago, the SEC uh, issued a rule on um, uh, money fund reporting. Uh, and because they heard uh, from providers of the data that there could be a competitive disadvantage if they had to reveal, if these funds had to reveal their holdings um, immediately, the SEC laid over the rule a 60-day latency period uh, for the data. So it wasn't made public until 60 days after. After a bit of experience, they rethought that and now have uh, decided to re uh, require that the data be made available publicly immediately. So um, the, 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 the point of that is that the, the government agencies that are compelling the data are thinking about the policy objective that they need to serve um, when they make that uh, uh, compulsion occur. On the other side is this uh, legal, often legal requirement, but clearly a policy requirement to um, to uh, uh, protect the data as is appropriate. And what this is really about, in my view, uh, is about making sure that we're honoring the, uh, the concerns that were raised by the earlier panelists around privacy, uh, around confidentiality, but not just because people want it to be confidential, but because there is an underlying purpose for that confidentiality. And so a competitive purpose would be a good, a, a good reason. We want our markets to flourish. We want there to be competition among investment advisors so that better products can be made available. So when the SEC first uh, uh, issued its rules, it, it, it honored that concern. It later learned that it wasn't so, so necessary. And what this 
what this does, the, these, um, these, these higher arching policy objective, uh, objectives do, is they create an inherent tension um, for people like me and others in the regulatory community with regard to finding the right balance where we should, where we should set the disclosure or the sharing requirement. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, how that plays out in specific regulations. And this is one of the great ironies to me. Everybody thinks OFR should be able to collect everything from everybody, keep it in-house, and then make it available to whoever needs it when, I guess, we or the other party thinks they need it. Um, right in that same law uh, where it says the OFR shall have the power to collect from any financial company information necessary, I'm paraphrasing, for the service of the council or financial stability monitoring, it also says, but we shall keep confidential that data um, uh, subject to uh, things like trade secrets, subject to things like proprietary interests, um, subject to things like privacy. So even within the very statute that created the OFR, you find this tension. And what you know, what, what really matters is the way that the staff who is engaged in these activities are able to uh, maneuver within these two competing policy objectives. Um, I think of uh, 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 one, of the, one of the main parts of, uh, of the legal work at the OFR for me and my staff is to look at confidential data sets that we've acquired from, from other agencies um, and work with researchers who are salivating over that data and wanting access to it and then wanting to produce results of, uh, uh, of their work. Um, and again, this, uh, all, of the, all of the higher level objectives that we've been talking about previously are carried out by people. So when Mark Flood, who is probably one of our most prolific authors at the OFR, um, wants to work with a confidential data set and publish a paper, um, it's the lawyer who ultimately has to uh, either advise the director or make the decision him or herself whether we've sufficiently masked the data to honor whatever the legal requirement of confidentiality was. There is absolutely no upside for the lawyer to say yes, and there's tremendous downside. And, and I think that's important because this is about incentives. You know, people don't get called to Capitol Hill to testify about the great working paper Mark got to publish because I said it was okay to publish that working paper. They get called to Congress to explain why there was a data breach. So this is where I think as, as policymakers and as um, uh, um, uh, members of these government agencies, we need to think about how we're incentivizing um, achieving these data sharing objectives among the people that are going to carry them out. So when we get into a, a conversation about data sharing, I'm going to, uh, I think, focus mostly on interagency data sharing. We've got something like 20 MOUs with other agencies, state and federal, uh, foreign governments. Um, we have uh, a dozen or so highly confidential data sets used for supervisory purposes. Our experience has been that we, we are met initially with uh, the question, what are you going to use this data for? Um, and you know, can you articulate the need? And, and the reason we get that goes back to this initial comment about the intended purpose of the collection in the first instance. Dodd-Frank did a great job of creating the OFR and the FSOC with very broad authorities. But one of the things it did is it said, before we can go out to the public uh, and, and go directly to firms to collect data, we have to go to other agencies. Dodd-Frank did not, in all instances, uh, in the organic statutes of these agencies, uh, in, uh, instantiate a financial stability mandate. So we, we know we've seen it to some degree in the Fed, uh, in, in their organic statute. At the SEC, Chair White uh, had done a nice job of, of, of looking at the mission of the SEC as one that is ultimately in support of financial stability. And, and in agencies that have been able to come to that conclusion, that, that they own a part of the broader financial system, um, they get more comfortable with our answer uh, to the question why you need it. Because it's always because we need to monitor financial stability. Um, there was a bit of a, a, a talk yesterday about knowing, o only being able to identify these trends when you see them. And that means sort of fishing through troves and troves of data. It reminds me of Potter Stewart, the Supreme Court Justice's definition of po uh, pornography. He said, I'll know it when I'll see it. Well, there is no lawyer who's going to permit the exchange of data um, based on a fishing expedition. They're going to be highly uncomfortable just saying, you know, we'll give it to you and let you tell us when you found what we need, what you need. And so we have to articulate a basis for 
um, the, the level of granularity uh, that we need with the data. The second thing they always want to know is, um, are you going to use it to embarrass us? And unfortunately, that's one of the political dynamics that, it, that exists in our environment. You know, we stand alone, the OFR does, as a monitor of financial stability and a, an evaluator of policies. And so that gives us the uh, ability to, without uh, any sort of uh, regulatory relationship with those who are regulated, uh, objectively review a policy and uh, make a, uh, an observation whether it's reaching its intended objective, whether it's too broad, whether it's too narrow. And that has the ability to create some discomfort for the agency providing the data to us. So imagine the conversation right after we release a working paper that says the Fed um, uh, stress test results are too predictable. And then we have to turn around and we have to say, oh, can you give us some more stress test data? We want to writes more papers about this. So th these, are, these are natural dynamics, and I think the way that you overcome the concern is ultimately through establishing trust relationships uh, between the agencies and the staff that, that work in these agencies, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. The next major question we get is, uh, are you capable of safeguarding the information? So if I own the data at another agency and uh, we collected it for a supervisory purpose and we can get comfortable that uh, an extension of our original purpose for collection was to provide it to an organization like the OFR, which will look at the health of the overall financial system, the question will be, does the OFR or whatever agency uh, ultimately gets the data have the technical capacity to safeguard the data? And will we? Is that sufficiently important in our culture? And I can say that I think it is in ours. We recognize that if we uh, are uh, uh, failing in protecting information, the flow of information will immediately stop. And so for us, we, we've largely overcome that hurdle with our other regulators. But this is a weakest link problem. You know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the minute the data leaves the, you talked about owner, I think you were the one that talked about owner, the owner's hands, that owner who is now accountable right, for having safeguarded the data, having, uh, maybe it's the IT people in the firm, uh, in, the, in the institution, um, uh, lets that go to another institution, uh, you lose control over the ability to say that is sufficiently safeguarded. So there's a lot of due diligence that goes on um, in, in that regard. And then um, uh, finally, what we, what we uh, recognize is that you know, a, a pattern of, of, of conduct, of demonstrating the ability to safeguard data is important. A, uh, 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 the existence in statutory authority of a need, a bona fide need for the data and the ability to articulate a data uh, is very important. Um, but ultimately, um, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the, the relationships with the individual staff members or the individual principals that allows the free flow of this information. What we end up doing, as David was talking about a moment ago, is, is entering into these memoranda of understanding. The thing is, th these are not legally binding documents. I, I don't imagine you're going to see the Fed going to court over an MOU against, uh, against the OFR. But what they do do is they reflect in writing very clearly the understanding that we have with respect to how we will use the data, how we will treat the data, and how we will uh, safeguard the data. Um, one of the things that the OFR has done, and Miriam Ochtenberg is in the audience, she's one of uh, my colleagues and she sort of spearheaded this for the government, is put together a collection of, of lawyers from federal reg financial regulatory agencies who are hammering out kind of best practices for these MOUs to expedite the process of sharing the data. Um, I think this is a really important uh, step to have taken. Uh, it, it, it sort of clears away the clutter around questions like what happens when a FOIA gets issued for the data, what happens when a subpoena lands on the desk at the, of the OFR looking for the data, and so on. And so there are things that we can do, mechanisms that we can put in place like MOUs, and in particular model MOUs, that can help um, move the data more freely between the regulators. I think the last thing that I would say on this point is it, what we need to see is a cultural shift among the financial regulatory agencies uh, which would um, allow all agencies and their staff to own the broader responsibility for financial stability. Once that happens, then they, the staff are incentivized to participate in this data sharing activity because they will um, own the failure for having uh, failed to share the data 
if, um, if ultimately there's another crisis that could have been prevented because uh, information was at our fingertips, but we, we failed to share it. So I'll stop with that. Great. Th thanks to all the panelists for great comments. Let's, let's throw it open to the, uh, to the floor. Uh, could you please uh, wait for the mic and uh, give your name and affiliation? Uh, and uh, uh, the comments are being recorded. So you have a question here? Hi, I'm Claire Brennicky from the FDIC. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, the first is, um, at the OFR or at other agencies, is there any um, possibility of looking towards the uh, census model of having research data centers um, and either piggybacking on the census RDCs as they're already set up or um, starting a financial version of that? And the second is sort of more general. Um, how do we, is anyone thinking about how we deal with uh, anonymization and aggregation of new types of data? So like as Sandhill was talking about, um, text, photos, things like that. Individual quotes and individual photos can be very salient in um, a research paper, but there's these issues of anonymization. And so I was wondering if anyone has a comment about that. Thank you. Thanks. So Matt, I'll, take the, I'll, Claire, take the first one. Um, uh, on these uh, census centers, yes, we've, we've been looking at that. This is one of these things that sounds excellent in, in, in the abstract, and then when you get into the details, it's a little bit more hairy. Um, there are two different ways. So what Claire's talking about are our are, are Census Bureau clean rooms. Is that what they're called? So they're, the Census Research Data Centers hold census data, okay. but uh, parallel to that using census technology, but not census data, are the federal statistical data centers that yeah. can house it using census technology, but wouldn't be census data. So that's, right. I think that's the question. Right. So there are, there are two ways to crack that nut. One is to have the OFR or any agency that can achieve this designated as a federal statistical agency, I think it's called, and that gets you under the umbrella of the legal framework that overlays the Census Bureau data. Once you do that, then it allows um, private re uh, researchers to come in and access the data. Um, the challenge there is, is having OMB designate the agency as a statistical agency. We haven't explored that too deeply. The second way that this happens is what Matt was just talking about, which is essentially a cooperative agreement with uh, the Census Bureau that would allow an agency like the OFR or any other agency to place their data uh, within these centers or one of these centers, so on census servers, and I think they have like security guards at the door and stuff like that, right? So there are these like locked down air gapped clean rooms where you can go in and get access to the data. That's something that we're exploring now. The challenge there goes back to one of the first things I said, which is, you know, when the provider of the data, so you could say the Federal Reserve provided it to the OFR, they did so having satisfied themselves that we had the, the IT capacity to secure this information and, I should make very clear, that the only individuals that would have access to the data are OFR employees. Um, OFR employees could include researchers who come on detail one day a week to work for us, but they're OFR employees. So placing the data into these centers um, and allowing non-OFR employees access to them would require going back to the providers of the data and renegotiating these agreements. But it's something that I think we're, we're really interested in exploring um, because uh, you know, one of our key objectives is to create this virtual research community and that's a way to make that happen. Um, with respect to the anonymization, I think others will have um, maybe more insight, but I know we've done some work in this area. I pointed to Mark a moment ago. You've done some papers around um, around uh, uh, sanitization of data. So there are some techniques that I think are, are, are very much being explored. One of the challenges we have is that uh, we may have satisfied ourselves that we've sufficiently aggregated the data. I think about like CDS data. Um, we do a lot of publishing with CDS data. We might satisfy ourselves that we don't think that th there are any data sources available that would help identify a particular outlier uh, institution in a, CD a part of the CDS markets. But um, uh, it's hard to be completely confident of, of, of that when you consider data held by other institutions that they may be able, may be able to combine with that data to reveal, unmask uh, the party. So some of the techniques we use are we, um, we go to the other agencies who might have more familiarity. Um, we often go to DT, DTCC, which provided us the CDS data, and ask them to sort of beat up the data for us. And that's a, that's a way of, of testing it. But, um, I think the, the, the ability to, to test 
whether we've sufficiently aggregated is very important. There was a comment about it yesterday. Um, uh, 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 differential privacy uh, was one technique that was discussed. I don't know if others have comments. Um, so let me just make a couple of comments on your, on your two questions. So on the first one, I mean, I think it's re the, your question is really about secondary data analysis and how we can go about doing that. And I think here we can look to some examples of where this is being done by, by other agencies. So for example, in, in the UK, uh, all of sort of the social, big social science research projects are funded by a body, a sort of equivalent here to the National Science Foundation, and there it's called the Economic and Social Research Council. And it's now a requirement for all uh, researchers who receive funding from the ESRC that they have to make the data that they collect for their primary purpose available for secondary data analysis. And there's now a UK data archive of all of the ESRC funded research. Um, so that's a good example. And sort of another example, sort of in, in UK officialdom, is um, H an HMRC, or Her Majesty's Reg Revenue and Customs, so basically the tax authority, has set up a data sharing room where, uh, authority, uh, where researchers can come in and actually take a look at um, tax data. Uh, and sort of a third example uh, is, and sort of closer to home in the central bank community, is that the Bundesbank uh, has set up something called the House of Microdata. And it's a great name, isn't it? Um, and, and again, the idea is to allow bona fide researchers to come into the central bank and make use of a data that cannot be publicly shared like we uh, share uh, normally uh, various statistics that are produced by central banks, but data that's of a confidential nature, but nevertheless might benefit from a fresh pair of eyes. On the, on the second of your questions, it's actually a very live question for me at the moment, because one of the research projects that we're doing within advanced analytics is to text mine supervisory letters. So basically every year, uh, our banking regulators will send out a letter to the firms that they regulate that's basically like a report card. And it sets out sort of the key material risks that from the PRA's perspective, that's the Prudential Regulation Authority, the, the bank supervisory arm of the Bank of England, that the supervisors see as the key material risks. And what we're trying to do is to assess whether we are writing and speaking to these firms differently on the basis of whether they're a large firm or a small firm, a, you know, systemically important financial institution or a credit union, uh, whether we uh, write differently to firms across time, et cetera. And previously, these letters were really only ever seen by the regulators who were writing them. Not even other regulatory teams would necessarily have seen another individual institution's letter. Well, uh, the governors are all very excited about this research. They want it published. But it's kind of uh, one of these situations where I'm scratching my head thinking, well, okay, how are we going to sort of publish research about these letters that you know, contain very confidential pieces of information that on the one hand strikes the balance of being insightful uh, for the, the wider research and public, and on the other uh, sort of maintains confidentiality. I don't have a good answer yet, but that's a concrete use case of I think the challenge that you were identifying. Are there other questions? Over here. Yeah. Oh, oh. I wanted to could you, could you give your name, please? I'm Lloyd Etheridge with the Policy Science uh, Center. Uh, I want to return to a proposal Robert Reischauer began to make when he was head of this Congressional Budget Office. For more, um, it's been around for over a decade that there needs to be a presidential commission on federal economic data uh, to rethink all of these things with and especially not just do the intellectual task, but to bring together all the stakeholders and users to take a fresh look at how fast we're getting data, uh, how we get things done. Um, I have that in mind because I think we should be thinking of the day after the November elections in this country as a, a critical point to plan for um, a lot of energetic um, um, discussion about um, we now have a new mandate, it's time to get things done. I can imagine with uh, President Clinton and a uh, 
Elizabeth Warren saying it's time to get this done on all these data and to m just hit the ground running with, um, with the transition teams for uh, major initiatives, probably with several dimensions that actually help everybody practically to address all of these things and send messages to agencies that, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the emotional consensus is changing in this country and we're, we're really going to start to make progress. Um, uh, the one point I could point, bring to this discussion from a, a World Bank Gates Foundation discussion on how do you create learning systems in which people share data is that we need some sort of um, higher level agreement of called WIFM, which is their acronym, what's in it for me? And if it's just saying we're going to, we're going to regulate you or maybe embarrass you or maybe add to your budgetary burdens without giving you more money, uh, that's not a very compelling and exciting and enrolling kind of process. So in the, bi in the biomedical world and in others where uh, this has succeeded, uh, of data sharing, it's a, a bigger upfront investment in the consensus building process, but everybody says, we've got to answer the WIFM question for every single person we want data from. Thanks very much. I, I, are there any other questions we could? Hi, Linda Avery. I'm the Chief Data Officer at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And I have a question for, for David um, relating to the, um, the inventory that you had brought up before. So um, in New York, we are also in the process of um, standing up a catalog of digital assets. We are expanding it a bit to also include work product, things like uh, mappings between the NIC data and the... Um, CRSP data, that type of thing. Um, one of the interesting dynamics that we're facing, however, is that we sometimes are getting some pushback from people in terms of registering their assets. This really plays into the data sharing dynamic in that people are afraid they're going to suddenly be overwhelmed by the number of inquiries they're going to have to face off to. And they don't necessarily consider facing off to those inquiries to be core to their job description. So I was wondering if um, the Bank of England in their experiences um, actually faced that same type of challenge at times. And again, this is not everybody, but we definitely hear this noise. Um, and I was wondering, you know, how has it turned out? I'll save you suspense and just say, well, so it's turned out well. But of course, it's a long journey from start to well. I think with any of these data initiatives, you really have to have executive level buy-in. And I think we've been fortunate with the current governor that he's really made data a top priority. So in his opening address to uh, bank staff, he actually uttered the words metadata, <laughs> which I believe, I don't know for sure, but in sort of 320 years of the Bank of England's history, I'd venture to guess that that's the first time that a Bank of England governor has used the word metadata. And so, you know, a few years ago, data was sort of pushed into the background, let's say relative to research. There's been a concerted effort within the bank to really put them uh, on par. And I think because of that, uh, when these data initiatives get rolled out, you know, it appears on sort of everyone's uh, Internet Explorer browser that, you know, there's this data inventory, you must comply, you should comply. And then that's usually a message that gets sent down from, in our case, the chief operating officer, uh, who's, a, who's got sort of deputy governor standing. And so I think, as with any sort of change initiative, you really just have to get those senior executives to buy in and push that message. Because it is uh, a non-trivial task to get everybody in the organization to take the time to register all of the data assets, as you mentioned. I think that's a critical point that you're making and the problem you're facing, because we see this all the time. 
from other agencies who are afraid that we're not going to understand the data and therefore misinterpret it and therefore create negative market impact, even, you know, even financial stability risk. I mean, and so we constantly get back giving it to you if you don't have the expertise to under to use the data properly will put a burden on us because we'll have to kind of hold your hand the whole time. And there's not an easy solution other than to try to demonstrate a sufficient capacity to understand it without all that hand-holding. Uh, so, so thanks very much for a great panel. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you're thinking, thinking like a statistical agency. Maybe I think th there's much to be learned uh, from that model of, uh, with taking, t taking data that's highly confidential aggregating in a way that's very useful, uh, but that does not have risks of disclosure. And I think that that's a very good model. You have so much to do, but being a statistical agency, uh, it would be, would be a, a, great, a great thing for us, whether, that, whether either informally or uh, in spirit. So let's, let's uh, adjourn now, continue this over a break, and I think we're supposed to be back at quarter two. Uh, so a quick break uh, and, and return in about 10 minutes.